Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Best Doctors webinar series for Physicians by Physicians. My name is Eric Glazer. I help lead physician engagement and social media here at Best Doctors. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Evan Falchuk, Vice Chairman at Best Doctors, and of course, our featured presenter, Dr. Mark Graber, who Evan will formally introduce in just a moment. Today is Tuesday, March 20th. Our session is entitled, How Doctors Think. Key Tactics for Physicians to Improve Diagnostic Accuracy. We are thrilled with how many of you are able to join us today, especially bright and early on the West Coast. For your colleagues who are unable to join us, uh, just a friendly reminder, we are rec recording today's session, and the on-demand version uh, of today's webinar will be available probably uh, by this time tomorrow, if not earlier. To start off, uh, just wanted to briefly introduce to you who we are. Uh, to start, I just want to level set and tell everyone that you know we are not a list of doctors that you read in a in a regional uh, regional magazine. In fact, uh, we are an important and popular health benefit uh, that large employers around the globe uh, use. We were founded back in 1989 uh, by Harvard Medical School professors. Fortune 1000 companies hire us to assist their employees uh, in various areas. For example, they may call us to identify the very best doctor in a specific specialty or subspecialty. So in those cases, we're, we are referring patients to our, to our best doctors. And we are, we are actually best known for providing the employee, in this case the patient, with the right answers to questions associated with complex clinical cases. And this comprehensive review, uh, we call an interconsultation case, and we'll describe that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, I'm going to now hand over the mic to my colleague, Evan Falchuk. He's going to tell you a little bit more about Best Doctors, how our services work, so you could get more context on that. As I mentioned, Evan is our vice chairman. He joined us uh, back in 1999 and currently leads all of our internal and public strategy. Thanks, Eric. I want to take a, a quick step back from some of the things that um, that Eric mentioned relative to do with, with best doctors and how we operate. Um, the company's been around for more than 20 years, and our focus is on a very important part of what's happening in the healthcare landscape today. Um, and that is that employers and other people who pay for health care have been working for many years to try to control the cost of health care and created many systems that I think a lot of us, both as patients and, and, and those of you obviously who are physicians, have been frustrated with. And um, what employers are increasingly seeing with the companies that we work with is that the primary, one of the primary drivers of problems that their employees have in the healthcare system is in getting the right diagnosis. Um, and there's an increasing amount of research being done on the problem of what people colloquially would call misdiagnosis, um, which has a very negative sound to it that might sound like malpractice. But what we're talking about is people not having an accurate diagnosis in a world in which there are treatments that are more and more targeted to very, very specific kinds of illness. Um, some of the studies that have been published, the Journal of the American Medical Association have reported that, that the prevalence of misdiagnosis may be as high as 15% as uh, of the population. Um, the Journal of Clinical Oncology published a study that showed for certain kinds of cancer, incorrect diagnosis was happening more than 40% of the time. Um, at Best Doctors, where we cover about 30 million people, last year we did several thousand cases of the kind I'm going to describe, and we found 29% of those had some kind of incorrect diagnosis in them. Um, we believe, and I'll, I'll show you in a second how this works, but we believe that there are some very fundamental drivers of incorrect diagnosis uh, that are really about um, doctors not having enough time to integrate the very, very fragmented information that exists in our healthcare system and being put under a lot of time pressure to make decisions quickly and, and get people off to start treatment. Um, so the, some of the work that um, really you're going to hear a lot about from Dr. Graber highlights how important it is for people to recognize what happens in a world in which doctors are required to make high-stakes decisions with fragmented information and not enough time. 
Uh, let me give you a, a short case example that gives you a sense of how Best Doctors works. And what you're seeing here on the slide is a, is a workflow that describes the collaboration that Best Doctors does between the patient, their treating doctor, and expert physicians. And in any case, we involve um, three, four, five, sometimes eight or nine different doctors to make sure that all the information in a case is, is collected, that it's integrated, that the right questions are being asked, and the right expertise is being accessed to make sure that the patient is getting the right care. Everything we do is focused on that kind of collaboration, bringing the expertise to where it's needed and helping the patient and their doctor uh, make informed decisions. I'll give you a quick case example that, that highlights this. Uh, we helped a woman who was an employee of a company uh, not too long ago who had been diagnosed with lung cancer. And um, that she had been started on uh, standard therapies for lung cancer and wasn't responding to treatment. She called Best Doctors looking for additional solutions, saying, listen, I heard that they're doing some interesting things with lung cancer at another facility. Um, are there other kinds of, of treatments that might work for my lung cancer? What do I do? Well, at Best Doctors, our process involves multiple steps. And the first piece of it is the intake, which you see highlighted here, and I've, I've just drawn a, a odd-looking purple line next to it. Um, there's, we, have a, we have teams of highly trained nurses whose job it is to take a detailed history from the member about their condition. Um, where were they diagnosed? How were they diagnosed? What are they being told? And we get them to sign releases. And then we have dedicated staff that collect their medical records. Now, on this intake, which happens here, that may take an hour, it could take two hours. We just try to get as much information as we can possibly get from this member. And then the medical records team tries to get as much information as we get on the member from the various different medical records that are available. Um, in any cancer case, and I mean every cancer case, we get the actual pathology blocks because we want to make sure that the, the slides are re-reviewed at an expert center. Um, and and where, they're, where they've got a great deal of expertise in differentiating the types of, of pathology that's there. Um, in this case, when we got the pathology of her uh, lung cancer, um, what the doctors said at this expert center was, you know, lung cancer um, pathology can be very diverse. And there are some kinds that would raise, should raise suspicion in the minds of the, of the person reviewing it that there could be, this could be a metastatic disease and not local lung cancer. Um, but oftentimes, because the pathologist may not be as skilled in that, it doesn't raise the red flags that it should. So in this case, as we were collecting the information and having the pathology looked at, that was raised by the expert pathologist. Now, at Best Doctors, we have collected all these records, and then we assign a doctor, actually two doctors, to provide a comprehensive analysis of that information and to review everything. And in going through that case, we found that she had had a prior history about 20 years ago of thyroid cancer that had been treated and, and uh, was thought to have been cured. Um, that information was then provided to the pathologist who was saying there was something unusual about this tumor and caused him to say, well, now we can think that there's a possibility that this could be metastatic thyroid disease. And there was a special kind of stain that was done, which revealed that these were, in fact, thyroid uh, cancer cells, not lung cancer cells. So now when we do our case, we summarize the uh, information that's been collected, write it up in a clinical summary by a doctor for a doctor, go to our database of, of experts. We have a, a peer-reviewed database of the, of the top uh, experts across all the different subspecialties of medicine, 50,000 doctors around the world. And now what our question was is, how do you treat metastatic thyroid cancer in the lung? And what are the appropriate uh, approaches? And we can find an expert focused on that to provide a report back to the member and to their treating doctor as to how to proceed. Um, so when you think about the collaboration that happened in this case, and you think about how it started, which was a question about how do I treat lung cancer that's not responding to therapy, and the question that we asked, which was how do you treat metastatic thyroid cancer, this was only able to happen because the information was integrated, it was analyzed comprehensively, and there was a collaboration between experts in pathology, in metastatic thyroid cancer, with the treating doctor, and ultimately with the patient. And this, uh, this member has had a very, very good result. 
Um, so that gives a, a, a big overview of, of how Best Doctors operates and what we're about, and I think should give you a sense of why the work of uh, doctors, especially Dr. Graver, is especially interesting for, for what we do. Um, so let me give you a brief uh, intro to Dr. Graber. Um, Dr. Graber um, is an internist who um, has been doing a lot of work on diagnostic error over the last uh, number of years. He's um, a senior scientist with, um, with a group called RTI International, Professor Emeritus at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, um, retired as the chief of the medical service at uh, Northport um, a VA Medical Center recently, um, but has been the chair of the Chiefs of Medicine and, and the president of the Association of VA Chiefs of Medicine. So he's had a great deal of experience in the area of collaboration and the comprehensive understanding of what's going on with patients, and has been doing a tremendous amount of work on patient safety, diagnostic error, and, um, and, and raising the profile of this issue. <clears throat> he's founded, uh, along with a number of other physicians, uh, the first conference on diagnostic error, um, the diagnostic and error, diagnostic error in medicine conferences, which have been run for the last few years, and founded the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, um, which, um, which, which we're happy to be supporting and, and we'll be talking about a little bit uh, later on. So I, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Graber. Before I do that, one comment is at the end of this presentation, there'll be an opportunity to, um, to answer a very short um, uh, survey. Uh, it's very important to us that we get feedback from the participants in our uh, events about the kinds of material that was presented and what would be useful for future ones. And also, if throughout this event, if you want to ask questions um, and um, that we can answer later on in the presentation, you can send it to us via WebEx, uh, via the, the Twitter hashtag that you see, or you can just send an email to, to Kelly Slump here at Best Doctors. Um, finally, if anybody would like to get a copy of the presentation slides, and I think you'll find the Dr. Graber slides are very, very interesting, um, you can send it to us in the uh, in the same in the, in, in the same way. Um, so, Dr. Graber, I'd love to turn it over to you at this point. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I hope, hope everyone can hear me okay. We can, we can hear you fine, Mark, and Kelly, I just want to remind you to give the presenter over to, to Mark so he can flip over his own slides. Yeah, Mark, we hear you coming in loud and clear. Great. Thanks very much. And I hope everybody can see the topics I'd like to go over this morning. There's four of them. I'd like to discuss how likely diagnostic error is, I'd like to think about what the major causes might be, but to do that, we have to back up a little bit and discuss how doctors think, and we'll, we'll finish up with the consideration of what we can do to make diagnosis more reliable. Um, it, it's so important to all of us to do a good job with diagnosis, and by and large we do. I mean, there's really nothing more complex than, than what physicians do when they go through this process. I, I love this quote from Sherwin Newland. It's the most critical of a physician's skills. It's every doctor's measure of his abilities. It's the most important ingredient in his professional self-image. And it's become a patient safety issue, but you know, it's kind of the opposite of the low-lying fruit. So over the past decade, we've all spent a lot of time and, and efforts to, to fix these other very important patient safety problems, falls, medication errors, wrong site surgery, and, and those are you know, very worthwhile efforts, but, but I think diagnostic error has been a little bit lost, and that's one of the messages I'd like to convey uh, this morning I think people have the perception it's too difficult to, to understand, and how will we ever fix these problems? And I think we've approached both of those very successfully. So a little joke to get things started. I went to the doctor with fluid on the knee, and he said, you're not aiming straight. Yeah, absolutely. So these, these errors are out there, and we all know that they exist. And we certainly know about the malpractice problems related to diagnostic error. And when I saw this data, it was kind of shocking to me this is claims data from Crico Risk Management Foundation. They insure the Harvard teaching hospitals, and they looked at their claims experience over a five-year period. And what you see here are the various categories, and the uh, leading cause by far were um, claims related to diagnosis. It's the bar on the left there. Um, predominantly, these are cases of delayed diagnosis of cancer, um, problems diagnosing cardiovascular disease, 
but all sorts of common everyday things. It's, it's just uh, it's the things we see every day in our practices. So we'd like this to be a little bit interactive, and, and you know what the question really boils down to is is what do you think your diagnostic error rate might be? So we have a little survey here. We'd like to give you a, a few seconds. So let us know what, what you think it might be in your own practice. Yeah, excuse me, Mark. So if everyone sees in the bottom right hand of their screen there's an interactive poll, you can just click on A, B, C, or D, and we'll show you the results uh, in just a few seconds. Each poll will be up for about 25 oh. seconds. Will we see the results, Eric? We're working on it, Mark. I, I think they're trying to push out the results right now. Okay. Well, we're going so to we move can, on. I remember when yeah. I was first asked yeah. the question. There they are. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'm in the minority. I, I remember when I was first asked this question, I was one of those less than 1% people. I really couldn't recall a major diagnostic error, and when I talk to other people, they're kind of in the same situation, but I see we have a much more educated crew here, so that's great. Um, and to tell you the truth, I don't know what your diagnostic error rate is. I don't know what mine is, and as far as I know, there's nobody in the country, not a single hospital, where diagnostic errors are being counted and, and tallied, but we do have quite a bit of data from, from different kinds of studies that that give us the impression it's really not zero. Um, Arthur Elstein's a cognitive psychologist from Chicago. He worked with doctors and studied clinical reasoning his whole career. It was Arthur's estimate that we were wrong 10 to 15% of the time. Uh, patient surveys have been done by the Isabel Foundation, and in that survey, one third of patients said that they themselves had experienced a diagnostic error or a family member or a close friend. Uh, second review studies are very convincing. This is where a second radiologist looks at your x-rays or a second pathologist, and there's a very significant rate of discovery when a person looks at these images. Uh, standardized patient studies are very uh, informative. This is where somebody with classical rheumatoid arthritis, uh, or COPD, for example, is sent out into the community, and in these kinds of studies, the misdiagnosis rate is 13%. I think we're all aware of the delays in diagnosing aortic aneurysm dissections and kind of a shocking statistic, uh, cervical cancer. If you look at women with a diagnosis of cervical cancer and go back to their last pap smear, not the abnormal one, but the one before that, 25 to 50 percent of those, if you reread them, you can find the abnormalities there. And the gold standard, of course, are autopsies where uh, major unexpected discrepancies, which would have changed the management are found 10 to 20 percent of the time. And these are just statistics. You know, if this happens to you or a family member or your patient, uh, these diagnostic errors become very real. Uh, John Ritter died of a diagnostic error. They uh, thought he was a heart attack when he came in with chest pain, but it was an aortic dissection. Uh, Maurice Gibb of the Bee Gees, they thought he had appendicitis. It was something much more serious, and he died later in the week after his admission. So we kind of have a discrepancy between the error rate, which seems to be in the 10 to 15 percent range, but our own perceptions, which tell us it's really lower. And I think part of the answer is a lot of the diagnostic errors we make really are inconsequential. I mean, it doesn't matter. The patient gets better anyway. The treatment we gave worked. But there's another issue going on that I'd like to discuss. So, so track all this question for us. Relative to your peers in academic or clinical medicine, how would you rate your own personal competency and reputation? Go ahead.
Okay, very interesting. Well, it's almost a normal distribution. Um, this is actually a survey that was uh, done many years ago and published. And 94% uh, of us rate ourselves as being better than our clinical peers. And it's actually a variant of a, a, a survey that was done by James Reason, where he asked people about their driving skills. So compared to the average driver, how would you rate your skills? And only 10% of drivers rate themselves below average, which is, of course, impossible. So we're a little bit overconfident as physicians, and it's not just because we're physicians, it's human nature. We're all a little overconfident in our abilities, which I think contributes in part to the diagnostic error rate. And here's one reason why. We really don't have autopsies anymore. They virtually disappeared, as everybody knows, from the medical scene. And there was nothing more powerful than, than seeing your own mistake on the autopsy table to, to make you be more cautious on the next patients that you saw. So how likely is diagnostic error? We don't really know. We know it happens, but not to me. It's the other guy. It's the guys at the other hospital who aren't as good or as careful as we are. We're, we're a little too overconfident. And there's another problem besides the diagnostic error rate uh, with diagnosis that we all have to keep in mind. It's just too expensive. It really is, and it's out of control. This is data published in the New England Journal on the rising costs of medical care in the United States. And if you look at uh, the cost of all physician services, it's the purple line there over a seven-year period, you can see that it rose about 40%, a completely unsustainable growth rate. And, and look why. Look at the number one and two reasons. It's diagnostic imaging. That's the red boxes on top. And the other diagnostic tests, those are the orange boxes. So the things that we do, our diagnostic workups, are, are not cost efficient. All right, so how likely is diagnostic error? More likely than we think, probably 10%. Uh, it causes appreciable harm and unsustainable costs. We perceive these rates to be low because most errors are inconsequential and we get too little feedback. We underestimate the risk and we're overconfident. And we really have to deal with this problem of cost sooner or later. Let's turn to the second question, how do doctors think? And I kind of mentioned Arthur Elstein, I'm cognitive psychologists have been looking at us for, for decades now, and they, they haven't really answered this question, but they've simplified it some. Um, and, and they're really starting to wonder, do doctors think? Because they thought we would, we would do the morning report thing. They thought when we analyzed the case, we'd list all the possibilities, we'd pull out Bayes' rule and start doing our calculations, and uh, that's not it at all. So let me give you a clinical case. Let's imagine we're seeing a 48-year-old stockbroker. He comes in with a rash. He was out in his backyard clearing the brush and uh, was wearing shorts. The rash is very itchy. And on exam, he's got these fascicular lesions in linear arrays over his legs, but they don't involve his feet or the ankles. And you know, here's what it looks like. So what does he have? Uh, we don't have a poll for this because I think everybody would get it right. He has poison ivy, right? I mean, we would all get that in a matter of seconds. So this is the current paradigm for how doctors think. It's called the dual process model. If you'd like to learn more about it, uh, Pat Crosscarry has several excellent articles I can refer you to. And it's really just a matter of recognition. Do we recognize what's going on? So when we saw those legs, there's a center in our brain that says, yep, I know exactly what that is. I've seen it before. And that process happens instantaneously, automatically, subconsciously, and it's called system one. It's the top pathway there. And it leads us to the diagnosis correctly in a millisecond. In contrast, if we don't recognize what's going on, we switch over to what's called system two, which is the deliberate, conscious consideration of what might be happening. And we have to sit there and think about it for a while. We may have to open a textbook or go online and look something up. And if we're lucky, we get to the correct diagnosis too. And successful clinicians are constantly flipping back between these two modalities. And if things are working really well, system two is checking on system one. But a major problem is that sometimes it doesn't. System two is lazy. We're cognitive misers is how these cognitive psychologists describe us. We like to get to the right answer quickly and expend as little effort as we can in, in doing so. So what are these objects? Just look at these and see if in a couple seconds you can recognize what these are. 
Okay, time's up. Uh, I think we all recognize the telephone. And on the upper right, it's a can opener. So these are examples of system one. We recognize those things instantaneously. What about the things on the bottom? What are those? You know, we struggle with these. We're not quite sure what these are. It turns out the lower left one is a, a hard drive, an external hard drive, and the lower right is a different kind of can opener. And we didn't recognize these. So that's system two. We have to stop and we ponder and, and uh, think about things deliberately. So what we're talking about are, are these mental shortcuts that expert clinicians use. The formal term for these are heuristics, but really what we're talking about is your intuition and pattern recognition and all the little subtle, automatic, subconscious ways our minds work. Uh, here's a reference to one of Pat cross Carey's articles. There's over 50 of these heuristics that have been described in medicine. And the one we used, they would tell us to solve that poison ivy problem is the availability heuristic. And really what we're saying is that diagnosis is available to us. And the reason it's available is because we've, we've seen it before. We may have had poison ivy ourselves. Probably the last 10 people who had rashes like that had poison ivy. So it's a wonderful heuristic, as all of them are. It's fast. It's effortless. It's very often correct. And it's correct because it approximates the base rate of disease in our patient population. But, and there's a big but with all heuristics, uh, it discourages us from considering a broad differential. Our experience is limited. Maybe we haven't seen some of the other things that were on that list. And we have a problem with too vividly remembering the big case. I recall we had a resident on our training program who patient came in with pneumonia and he made the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, which turned out to be correct. Uh, but from then on, every patient who came in, he was overrating sarcoidosis in terms of its probability. So just because it's available does not necessarily mean that it's correct. So just to give you an example of how these heuristics work and how they can sometimes lead us astray, here's our third survey question. Take a few seconds on this one. Think about the letter R. Which is more common? R is the first letter of a word or R as the third letter? Okay, the results will be showing up soon, but I remember when I took this quiz for the first time, to me, it was R as the first letter. And that's because all these words just came into my mind. In my typing class in, in high school, roll over Red Rover was my typing exercise. And in contrast, I struggled thinking of words where R is the third letter. Uh, but as you can see, just looking at this slide, there's many words where R is the third letter. And the correct answer is really B. It's three times as common to be the third letter as the first. But we don't all get that right, and the errors are attributable to failures of the availability heuristic. So yeah, we're pretty sure it's the West Nile virus. We do this all the time in medicine. We recognize the features of something, and we're pretty sure we're right, and often we are, but we're not 100% correct. So summarize, how do doctors think? We use our intuition. We use these subconscious automatic processes. They work extremely well, but they're not perfect. And many diagnostic errors arise from problems in using these subconscious heuristics. And we know very little about how our subconscious mind works, and that's part of the problem that we have to deal with. None of these things are available for our conscious review. Just to give you some examples, take a look at these two lines. Which looks, long, which looks longer? Which of these lines is longer? Well, I think we'd all say the one on the right is longer, but it's not. Um, these are identical lengths. It's a trick that our subconscious mind uses. Which of these tables is longer? I think we'd all agree it's the one on the left, but it turns out these tables are almost identical. Another way in which our subconscious processing goes astray. Read these two lines. A, B, C, 12, 13, 14, right? Well, maybe, but the middle symbol you see is identical in the top and the bottom lines. And this is something our subconscious mind does all the time. It creates a context for us. So in the top line, we're in the alphabet context, and we say A, B, C. And in the bottom line, we're in the number context, and we say 12, 13, 14. Uh, but 
you know, maybe it's A13C or, or 12B14. And a final example, take a look at these symbols. Are they spinning around for anybody? Well, for many people they are, and just another problem with our subconscious mind. And my point here is that we just really have no insight to how our subconscious mind works. It plays all these tricks on us, and yet this is what we're relying on to make life and death medical decisions and diagnosis. It's just a little scary. Okay, so what are the causes of diagnostic error? This is the framework that I like to use. And, and what you see here is a patient going along his clinical course on the bottom there. Something bad happens, there's a diagnostic error. And sure enough, there will be a doctor at what we call the sharp end, and it'll be me if it's my patient. And when we're talking about the sharp end, we're worried about the cognitive errors that might have gone wrong. What, what was wrong in my clinical reasoning? But if you call the Institute of Medicine report that came out about 10 years ago, they said really what we should be paying attention to is the blunt end, all the system errors, the context in which we work, because these are incredibly important in determining our predisposition to errors. So it's things like communication and coordinating care, the training we receive, the policies, the procedures that are in place, the culture that exists in our institutions. Was I distracted? All of these things are part of the system in which we're trying to work successfully. We did a study of diagnostic error in five hospitals in the New York area. We found 100 cases, and we tried to use the system to dissect out what the problems were. This is what we found. Uh, the most common thing were that both system and cognitive errors were taking place in the same case, uh, but there were also cases where they're just system things or just cognitive things. So if you ask yourself the question, how often is there a cognitive problem? It's, it's the big piece of pie on the left, but also the, the yellow piece there. So two-thirds of the time, there's a problem in our clinical reasoning. And the same is true with the, with system problems. So it's the big piece of pie plus the red one. Two -thirds hey, Mark, this is Eric. Excuse me just for a moment. I just wanted to remind everyone that you could submit questions to Mark through the Q&A module on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll allow about 10 minutes at the end to take all your questions. I know some of you have already submitted some questions, but I just wanted to encourage everyone and remind those who just logged in late that there is a Q&A module to the right, and simply type it in and press submit, and we'll put that in the queue, and we'll, we'll, we'll pose them to Mark at the end of the session. Yeah, please, love questions. So just to summarize, we were, we were saying there's lots of system things and lots of cognitive things, and in any one case, there's many things going on. On average, we found five distinct errors in each case of diagnostic error. And we're not going to spend much time about the system things, even though this is where a lot of the money may be. Um, you know, it's a, as you would expect, it's breakdowns in communication and coordination, expertise not being available when it's needed, like do you have a radiologist to read your films on nights and weekends, breakdowns in testing, are, are we getting those critical tests back all the time? Not really. Uh, how good a job are we doing with supervising our trainees? Etc. You know, and I think if we set our minds to it, we could fix every single one of these things, and I think we will over the next decade or so. And I'm not going to really focus on them anymore. I'm going to stick with the cognitive errors, which to me are more interesting, and they're more under our control. These are the things that, that we can affect as, as clinicians ourselves. So here's the fourth question. What do you think the leading cause of cognitive error might be? Is it A, faulty knowledge? We just don't have enough medical knowledge and experience? B, we don't do a good enough job collecting the data, or C, faulty synthesis, putting it all together. Give us an answer down in the lower right-hand side there. Okay, interesting. Nobody picked faulty knowledge, which turns out to be very perceptive. That's exactly what we found. Uh, faulty knowledge is almost never the cause. Medical school works, thank goodness. Um, there are some problems with faulty data gathering. That's, that's not the major issue. The real meat is in faulty synthesis. 83% of the problems are there, as most people correctly identified. And I'd like to give you a case to kind of just show you how all this works. I think you'll have a better feel for it. So this was a patient that we saw at my medical center, was an elderly gentleman, 
came in the middle of the night um, almost delirious. He had abdominal pain. He was not a good historian. He was kind of pointing to his stomach and moaning and growing. Uh, we knew he had advanced uh, COPD. He told us that. He came in with his inhalers and said he'd been on steroids for most of the last six months. And he said the pain was very much like the pain he had in his last admission, which was for a bleeding ulcer. On laboratory exam, his hematocrit had dropped. There was really nothing impressive on his physical exam except for some ill-defined abdominal tenderness. And the residents who were evaluating him in the emergency room said, you know, I think it's his ulcer again. It's, he's got GI bleeding, and that's what's going on, which seemed reasonable. It explained all the facts. But over the next couple hours, he didn't do well. He went into shock, was transferred to the ICU, and uh, the case was reconsidered. We wondered whether he had an aortic dissection. He was sent to the CAT scan suite, which sure enough, they found it, but that's where he died and could not be resuscitated. So the clinical diagnosis of bleeding ulcer was completely wrong. He had an aortic dissection. And when we did the root cause analysis, it turns out that this was, in fact, known. It was in his medical record. He, in fact, knew it and just didn't tell it to us because of his delirium. Nobody bothered to call his family or his uh, primary care physician to see what his history might be. So you can start to see where the errors are in this case. Um, the system errors were, you know, his past his chart was about a foot thick. It didn't show up for about six hours in the emergency room, so why weren't they available? Uh, why didn't the residents discuss it quickly with their attending? That didn't happen. And these are problems with the organizational culture. It was considered okay for the charts to be four hours late in showing up. And it was considered acceptable to wait till the next morning to discuss a seriously ill patient with the attendant. So those are the system things. In terms of the cognitive things, how about the clinical knowledge? Well, we talked to the doctors. Yeah, they know about aortic dissection. They know it can present like this. How about the data collection? Well, there were some problems there. They failed to get the significant history that he, in fact, was known to have uh, an aortic aneurysm, and the decision had been made because of his significant COPD not to operate on it. But I think, in my mind, the major problem here was they just didn't put the facts together correctly. Just with what they knew, I think they could have suspected that there was something else going on besides this bleeding ulcer. They were in the wrong context. They were thinking it was a GI problem because of his abdominal pain, but it wasn't. And they committed a, a, a sin, if you want to call it that, of premature closure. They jumped to a conclusion, and they didn't really consider other possibilities. So in our study of 100 cases, turns out premature closure was the most common problem we encountered. And this business of faulty context generation was next. Faulty perception was a significant issue. Examples would be physicians trying to read their own chest x-ray instead of waiting for the radiologists to give them an expert opinion, failures of heuristic thinking, and many, many more. Say, hey, what's a mountain goat doing up here in the cloud bank? Um, these context errors are certainly not confined to medicine. If you study aviation disasters, it's a very serious and common problem. The pilot thinks he's at 10,000 feet, but he's really at 1,000 feet. They think there's enough gas to get back to the airport. There isn't. They think the autopilot is engaged, but it's not. So these context errors are ubiquitous. And if you think about your everyday life, I think you'll recognize many examples of context errors, too. Premature closure is another example of human nature. Uh, it's falling in love with the first puppy for any dog lovers out there. I'm sure you didn't go look at four different litters. You went to look at one, and you fall in love with this cute little puppy, and that's the end. Uh, as human problem solvers, we want to be done. We want to be moving on. And as soon as we're presented with a problem and we've solved it, it explains all the facts in front of us, we're happy. We're moving on to the next case. Herbert Simon is a uh, Nobel laureate in economy and, and coined this term satisficing. We do this all the time. We satisfy as opposed to optimizing, sitting down, thinking of what all the alternatives might be and giving them serious consideration. We do that very rarely. Okay, well, let's move to interventions. What can we do to reduce the likelihood of diagnostic error in terms of these cognitive problems? And I'd like to propose that there's two things that we can do ourselves. We could increase our clinical knowledge. We could try and be more expert. And that would mean, I don't know, you know, doing some more CME activities, 
studying some more, going to courses, reading books more. Second thing we can do is we could try and improve our clinical reasoning. We could le learn about these system two things and system one things. And failing the things we could do ourselves, we could go get help. So that's the final alternative we'll consider. So let's go back to our, our dual process model and think about this a little bit. What can we do in terms of improving system two, the deliberate conscious consideration? Well, we talked about you know getting more training, getting more experience. I think simulation is going to play a major role here where we can, instead of spending a year in practice to see 30 variants of heart failure, we could do it in a simulation lab in an afternoon. And practicing evidence-based medicine is probably something we could all do a better job with. These are powerful tools, tools that are getting better all the time, and, and we tend not to use them. What could we do in terms of system one? What could we do about these, these automatic things? Let's talk about that for a second. So if I told you the major problems are premature closure and faulty context, failures of heuristic, all these system one things, the way to fix these things is really to switch over to engage system two. And how could we do that? Well, there's lots of possibilities, and, and I think all of these would work. We don't have good evidence for any of them yet, but how about just pausing to reflect, just taking a minute. I know we're all pressed for time. But just stop, do that diagnostic timeout. I think that would have tremendous value. The universal antidote is considered this advice to consider the opposite. You know, just think to yourself, what else could this be? What else could the patient have besides this thing I'm thinking about? The crystal ball experience is a technique that was developed in the military where they're training privates to be lieutenants and they give them a challenge. You know, you have to capture the next hill with five tanks and 500 troops and, you know, draw up a battle plan and, and uh, give it to me. And they, they turn it in and the instructor looks at it and says, you know, great plan, but you didn't really think this fully through fully. You know, what else did, might you have considered? I can look into the future and see your plan didn't work. And they come back with a second plan. So after going through this a cycle or two, they learn to always have a plan B in mind, which is probably good, good, be good advice for us clinicians too. And finally, just be comprehensive somehow. How could we be comprehensive? Lots of different ways. There's mnemonics. There's tricks we could use. I'll show you vitamin C, C, and D in a minute. If you've worked in emergency medicine, you know ROWCS, rule out the worst case scenario. So if your patient comes in with chest pain, yeah, it's probably musculoskeletal, but make sure it's not a heart attack or pulmonary embolism. Um, there's decision support products available now. Isabel, he explained. Here's vitamin C, C, and D. We have this on the wall up in our morning report room. So yeah, everybody knows to think about cardiovascular things and GI things. And when you're done going through the systems, this is a different way of thinking through a differential diagnosis that might prompt you to think of something unusual. How about using a checklist? It works in surgery, it works for central lines. Maybe a checklist for diagnosis might be a good idea. You know, obtain your own history. Don't just Trust the, res the history that the student or the resident obtained. Uh, the third thing, very important, pause to reflect. Take that diagnostic time out. Was I comprehensive? What's the worst case scenario? What are the don't miss entities? And I think the last thing is critically important too. You know, embark on a plan, but acknowledge uncertainty and make the patient your partner. I, I think we should be much more honest about diagnosis. It's not a certainty. We're always just playing the odds. And we see if we engaged our patients and told them that, if we told them, listen, this is what I think you have, here's what you have to watch out for, I think you're going to be better in three days, and if you're not, make sure they know how to get back to you, when to get back to you, how to get back to you. And that would be an opportunity to rethink things and, and catch an error that would otherwise might have been made. These are these electronic tools I was mentioning. DXplain was uh, developed at the Mass General Hospital. Uh, Isabel is available online. There is a charge for both of these. There are three products available. They're not quite as good, but, but they work too. Um, this is kind of how they work. So this is the explain a screenshot. You type in some key symptoms and signs of your patient. So if my patient has chest tightness and an elevated troponin, a little hypoxemia, the explain gives you these things to consider, some common things up on the top, some more rare things down on the bottom, and it's a way to jog you out of system one. It's a way to, to you know, just for a moment, consider some other possibilities. Isabel has been studied. Uh, 
this is a study that just came out recently. It works very similarly to D explain. This was a study done in a pediatric ICU. They looked at uh, how the residents did in terms of patients who did not have a diagnosis on admission. So left to their own devices, they got the diagnosis correct 89.4% of the time. If you want to look at the converse of that, that's that 10% error rate that we saw earlier. They weren't correct 100%. If they used Isabel, 92.5% uh, of the time, so it helped them. They went up 3 or 4%. Hey, Mark. Yes, hi, Eric. Hey, two, one thing, a couple of things. Questions are coming in, so I, I just want to remind everyone to use the Q&A module. I, do, I want to take a question from the module because it's perfect for this, for this point that you're making. One, one of the questions from one of our attendees is, is, is diagnostic accuracy better or worse at teaching hospitals and major medical centers? I don't know if you know that off the top of your head or if you could address that question for our attendee. <laughs> Well, I worked at teaching hospitals in my own life, and I'd love to believe we do a better job. And I, you, it, I think the reason we do a better job is probably not because we're better doctors, but we have so many people working on the same case. Uh, but there's lots of things that detract from that. We tend to not think things through independently. We accept what the students and residents tell us blindly too often. So to tell you the truth, I mean, there is no form date on that. would love to do that study. Absolutely. Sure. And one other uh, question that was asked of us is some people have requested your slides. I just want to remind the folks on the call, in a few minutes uh, we're going to put up a just a feedback form. It'll take you about four or five minutes, multiple choice questions to complete. During that time we'll be providing, uh, we'll be doing more Q&A from the audience, and you could also request a copy of the slides that Mark's presenting today, and we'll send them right out to you uh, before the end of the day. So uh, thanks, Mark. Continue on. Thanks, Eric. So you can see the problems with using these decision support uh, products. There's a cost to it. There's money cost. It takes a minute. And, you know, how much does it improve us? It's, it, it, you look at this at face value, it's, it's only gone up 3 or 4%. But to tell you the truth, I look at it the other way around. The error rate has gone down from 10% to 7%. And to me, that's huge. If I can take a 3 or 4% chunk out of that error rate, I'm a happy guy because those are patients not getting injured. This is a second opinion. At first, I thought you had something else. How about second opinions as a way to cut down on diagnostic error? Well, absolutely, this works. And we've already seen some of the data on this. So in pathology and radiology, when a second person goes through the material, you detect errors that the first person missed. And that's how best doctors works. Um, I, I've seen data that show that 20% of the cases that are rethought by best doctors processes uh, diagnostic error is discovered. So for sure, fresh eyes catch errors, and especially if you have the time to go through a case in detail as the best doctor systems allows you to do. And I think we have to face up to the fact that our patients are getting second opinions all the time on the Internet. Um, Google says that 80% of their users have done healthcare searches, and at any one instant of the millions of people who are on Google, one in nine is doing a healthcare search. <clears throat> there's over 4 billion sites related to health, and there's actually a study that's been done looking at how well Google performs if you put in your symptoms. Does it give you the diagnosis? Well, yeah, it does, but, but not very effectively, 58% sensitivity. So all sorts of diagnostic error when people try and use Google, even physicians, although we do use the web for many other things and, and to great value. So let's look at this from a slightly different perspective. This is how we progress through our, through our lives as doctors. We all start up up on the top as medical students. We don't know very much. Uh, our diagnostic accuracy is very limited. We make a lot of mistakes, and it's very effortful. And as we go through medical school and our training and we're out in practice, we get better and better and better until we end up down at the bottom. We're, we're like experts a great deal of the time. Maybe not all the time, and, and you really want to be an expert because experts make the fewest mistakes, and they make diagnosis in the most cost-effective manner in terms of their own cognitive efforts, but also in terms of cost. So that's the goal, to get there. And the problem is, a lot of the time, we're not there. We're a little bit short of it. We're in the middle somewhere. We're in that middle circle. We use our heuristics. And that's okay. You know, we'll get the correct diagnosis most of the time. 
So the question I'm, I'm asking you and, and myself really is, you know, should we trust our intuition or should we take this extra time and effort to get a second opinion, to reflect? Because there's a cost involved. There's a monetary cost, there's a time cost, and also, you know, I don't really know if it's going to move us more to the right, if it's going to move us tremendously towards higher reliability, or is it just going to move us up? Well, we don't really improve reliability, we just improve the cost involved. It's a very serious question that we have to address. And I'll give you a cute little example that will help us think this through. Um, uh, this is the, uh, imagine you're taking a multiple choice like we've all done many times, and this is one of the questions. So what is the gestation period of an Asian elephant? Is it four, eight, 12, 18, or 24 months? And while you're thinking about that, here's the question we'd like you to, to consider. So what advice did they give you at the start of the exam? Should you trust your intuition on a tough question like this? Or at the end of the test, should you go back and rethink the questions that you weren't sure about? A or B? Go ahead and, and give us your answers to that question. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Uh, kind of mixed, and uh, that's, that's what I found when I, I've asked other people. Some people are told, trust your intuition. Some people are told to go back. Uh, for those of you dying of curiosity, though, the poor elephants are pregnant for almost two years. That's really the answer to the question. And here's the answer to the second question. It's actually been studied six different times over the past 80 years in, in college settings, that's the C, in medical school exams, those are the M studies, and on national boards, that's that last study with the B, and actually thousands of questions. They, they look to see how often do people change their answer, and do they change it to the wrong answer or to the right answer, and you can see very clearly in every single study, you're much better off going back and reconsidering it, because twice as often you're going to change your answer to something that's right as opposed to something that's wrong. Definitely, do not trust your intuition. Go back and think. And the same thing has been found in the studies that are starting to come out in terms of diagnostic error. So this is a recent study from Sylvia Mamid and her colleagues where they gave clinicians cases to analyze. Some of them were very simple. That green thing up at the top, so the accuracy, accuracy score was very high and pretty much the same, whether the doctors were asked to think these through and give their immediate response or asked to think about it for a while and think what else it could be. It didn't really matter on the simple cases. But if you look at the blue cases, which were the harder ones, very significant difference. The accuracy score significantly improved when they were given instructions to think about it for a minute, make a little list of the things that favor the correct diagnosis or argue against it. So if the choice is blink or think, definitely think. So let's summarize with the advice I'm giving you here in terms of uh, trying to cut down on diagnostic error. I think definitely we should all try and be more expert, which is a matter of getting more training, getting more feedback, trying to replace those autopsies somehow, uh, getting more experience, trying to take advantage of simulation, all those things would be valuable. Another thing we can do ourselves is try and improve our clinical reasoning. So we said for system true, system two, try and use evidence-based practice. And for system one, those automatic things, don't trust your intuition, practice reflectively, take a second or two, try and be comprehensive, consider the opposite, maybe use a checklist. And if failing those first two things, which we can do ourselves for sure, try and get help, use decision support, get a second opinion, ask a colleague. So where are we? We appreciate the scope of the problem and the rate of diagnostic error. We have an understanding now of how doctors think and how this goes astray. We can identify the root causes of diagnostic error. It's not that tough, any of us could do it and we have a number of strategies we could use to decrease the risk of error. So let's get going, and thanks for your time and attention. Hey, thanks, Mark. That was terrific.
You there? I am here. Okay. So I'm we have here. a bunch of questions. I did want to, before we get into some of the q and I did want to remind everyone to save the date uh, for the Diagnostic Area and Medicine Conference, which I know you're going to be a big part of, uh, November 11th to the 14th. And I'm going to put a feedback form up for everyone to to uh, I'm going to put a feedback form up for everyone to fill out, and you could certainly uh, request more information on this conference. You could request a copy of Mark's slides as well. We have a bunch of questions that have come in, so I'm going to sort of take them in the order that they've been received, and we'll we'll try to finish up uh, right about maybe 30, 35 minutes past past the hour. So, Mark, one of the questions that came in in the very beginning was uh, around uh, the difference in error, system versus cognitive. And the question was, does system errors affect cognitive or does cognitive affect system? Yeah, so good question. You know, I like this, this uh, dichotomy of system versus cognitive because it makes it easy to discuss. But, but whoever asked the question is absolutely right. They're, they're interrelated in many ways. So if you're practicing in a very busy environment like most of us are and you have 10 minutes per patient and you wish you had 30, uh, that's a system thing, but it affects our cognitive behavior. Uh, we, 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 we rush to judgment in those situations. So for sure, it's much more complicated than I've, I've laid it out here. It's just a convenient way to break things out. Thanks. And uh, another question was, is technology – helping or hurting a diagnosis. And I'm going to actually add my a little bit of uh, editorial rights here and add a second part to that question and ask you if you think social uh, social networking platforms could help or hurt uh, in diagnosis to facilitate collaboration. So two-part question. The original, te the original question was, is technology helping or hurting diagnostic accuracy? And then my follow-up would be, do you think social networking platforms uh, in collaboration, can that help or hurt diagnostic accuracy? Yeah, so both really interesting questions. I, I, I'll give you my bias. I worked in the VA for my entire career, and we had a really wonderful electronic medical record. <laughs> at least I liked it. And I think it helped me. Uh, and the major way it helped me, or at least one of the major ways, is it, 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 uh, it freed up some time for me. So instead of writing out 20 prescriptions for my patient, I could click through those in, in 10 seconds. And I think giving patients, sorry, giving physicians the gift of time is, is the most valuable thing that these electronic things will, will bring to us. And I think they do help in terms of diagnosis. I mean, it's the, the times we are uh, able to think things through and use system two, you can go online and, and check your facts. Uh, so I think definitely it'll work to our advantage. I'm pretty convinced of that. Is there good data to that effect? No. Absolutely not. And I know a lot of people are struggling with uh, electronic systems that are clumsy and actually slow them down. So I think in those settings, it could actually detract. The second question about the social media is very interesting. And uh, it gets into the Google kind of thing. So, so I'm wondering, in my own mind, does that help make diagnosis more reliable, that, that patients can go online and look things up themselves? Because I know a certain fraction of the time they're going to be misled, uh, not only because the information online is misleading per se, but they just don't have the wherewithal to interpret it. So it's, it's like asking your friend or your colleagues when you have an illness and then getting their opinion. It has some value, but I think it may actually increase the diagnostic error rate to some extent too. Um, you know, for sure, if, if you had an ideal system, if you had a, a problem you weren't sure was, I, you know, I have these symptoms. What do I have? The best way to address that is to go straight to the expert. And, and the problem with our medical care systems is we don't have enough experts and we don't have those pathways set up, so we take all these shortcuts. We, we go see our, our internist who's, who's good but not an expert, or, or we ask a colleague or we go online. So it's good that people are looking and, and they're wondering. Maybe some of those people will get to the correct answer. But it's not the same as going to the expert. So I really don't know how that's going to play out in the long run. It's like the, the nurse practitioners who are out in uh, Target and Costco. Are, are those going to in, increase the diagnostic uh, error rate or, or, or help people? I, I really don't know. Right. A couple 
couple of quick reminders. Uh, you'll be able to request again the slides by taking the feedback form. Yes, the recording will be available from today's session. Should be available by the end of the day today, so long as the technology cooperated with us. Those are a couple of questions that have come on through. Uh, next question from our attendee, and maybe time for one more after that, Mark, is any difference in diagnosing between young and older doctors? Uh, yes, uh, and the news is not good on that score for those of us who are older doctors. Uh, there's very good evidence that uh, the cognitive functioning uh, of elder physicians does not match up to, to younger physicians. And it's been looked at a number of ways. Uh, if you want to look up the studies, they've been done by Jeff Norman and uh, of other, uh, others. Um, you know, you always wonder how those studies were done because you could probably set up a study that shows that, that older doctors do better if you had set up a study that relied more on experience. But uh, the way they were done, it, it turns out to be not such good news for those of us who are advancing. Terrific. And then we have a couple of other questions, Mark, that I'll, I'll email you because I, I know people have office hours and patients waiting to see them. I'll close with this final question to you from one of our attendees. It reads, to me, premature closure is like the time I was hiking and had the wrong road map. I was trying to fit the land to the map that I had. How do we guard against this and pull back, or do we have to get a second opinion to deal with this? Yeah, you know, I think it's really fun to, to go through the next day or two for anybody who's still on the call and try and recognize situations where these context things and these premature closure things just happen in your everyday life. And I think to the extent that we're aware of it in, in our day-to-day uh, -day existence, I think it will help us be better doctors. Terrific. Yeah, this was a great session. I, I want to be sensitive to folks who have a, a tight schedule today. I know we promised 60 minutes. We're at 62 minutes. So I'm going to I'm gonna end the call right now. I want to thank everyone for attending. We're going to be doing these on a monthly basis. So if this is the first time you've attended a, a Best Doctors uh, for Physicians by Physicians webinar, uh, we hope that you'll join us again next month. Mark, special thanks. Great job today. Really appreciate the time. I know it's early out there on the West Coast where you're traveling, so I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to Evan Falchuk for his participation as well. And uh, again, thanks to all of you. We'll send you out copies of the slides. Uh, we'll send you out more information on the Diagnostic uh, Medicine Conference coming up in November. And we hope to see you back here next month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric.